um, either personally or, or from, from a distance um, through her practice. Uh, she's a, a writer, an actor, a theatre maker, um, a campaigner. Uh, she writes about the politics of theatre, but also the theatre of politics. Um, some of you may not know, and I'm going to give you a good treat here, but she's also a novelist. And if you have read any of her novels, um, I hardly recommend them. She's published 13 so far. She'll have two more um, that are coming out uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, she writes detective fiction, which I particularly enjoyed. She has a wonderful private investigator called Saz Martin. Um, <laughs> and that's just to let you eight, know. The last eight books, though, so you should put it out of the book if you were looking at the latest one. <laughs> <laughs> you can still get one, Alison. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what books are that pays their taxes? I'm oh, sorry? Or in bookstores, or in hives, not Absolutely, absolutely. Um, probably more pertinent to this afternoon's um, program is that Salah is the founder and co-director of the Fund Pugs campaign, which is committed to the idea of empowering people to have what she calls radical fun through creativity and through bringing arts and science together. And to me, that's what I'm going to do is talk about um, this afternoon, her paper, presentation, her talk is entitled there is no austerity in brackets of brilliant people. So, thank you. Hello. So, um, if you can, could you please stand up and put both hands up in the air? Thank you. Um, so there's a big old lie going on in the room at the moment. Put one hand down if you've got a pension. If you've got one. A pension. Yeah, if you've got a pension of any sort. Put one hand down if you've ever had sick pay. Put one hand down if you've ever had holiday pay. <laughs> Sit down if you've ever had compassionate leave. Who's left with two hands up? Hello, Carriot! Here we are! Thank you, sit down. Um, there's a bollocks going on. That is, we in the arts. It's bullshit. There is no we in the arts. God, I wish there was, yeah? But there's no we. There's a bunch of us who've been freelancers as long as we can remember. There's another bunch of people who are attached to buildings or organisations. And there's another bunch of people who are attached to the academy that are studying those and reporting on it. But the people over here, I've been free arts since I was 17 and I got my acting card at 18, are in a really different position to all of these people. Yeah? <clears throat> Not good, bad, or, or wrong, or, or whatever, just different. And unless we talk about that, because we never talk about that, unless we acknowledge that in the beginning of our discourse, we are talking about our, I say discourse, I must be at a university. We are talking about <laughs> ourselves as if we are the same and we're coming from the same place and we're not. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I come from in order to explain why Fun Palace has happened. So, I'm the youngest of seven. I was born in a council estate in Woolwich, and earlier John said about how um, there is a much worse uh, life expectancy in Manchester as opposed to London, as if London was one place. Right, my friend from the East End? <laughs> I live in South East London. Uh, my part of South East London is poor as fuck. I promise you there are parts of Manchester where there's a better life expectancy than my part of South East London. It's all up and down, and unless we acknowledge that as well, we are lying to ourselves, okay? So my bit of South East London, I was born in Woolwich, I was young as a seven in the council estate. My parents were both labourers. They both went to school at the age of 14. I am the first in my family to ever go to university. Not because I was brilliant and bright and smart, but because at the age of five, my family moved to New Zealand. New Zealand is going to explain why I can talk as fast as a match can. Because people know Australia and New Zealand is not one country, but we do talk fucking fast. Now, just to point out why Australia and New Zealand is not one country, well, for a start, we gave our vote to women 25 years before we pronounced it. The other one is that there's the, the distance between uh, London and Moscow is the same distance as Auckland to Sydney. There you go, now you've learned something. Brilliant. Okay. Um, as my dad would say, your day is not wasted. Anyway, my dad, who was a good old socialist, came to England, despite the fact that he spent four and a half years in the prison war camp in Germany, uh, married my mother, had seven kids between them, they were Catholic. 
Um, by the time I was five, my mum's parents were dead, my uh, father's father was dead, and my father's mother was dying. He hadn't been back to New Zealand for over 20 years. And in those days, look, I'm only 52. Young people, only 52. I know. I know you don't believe that they can mean only that goes to 52. <laughs> but I thought you seemed like we're all friends. Keep them. Um, anyway. Um, we moved to New Zealand because uh, that was the right thing to do. My mother, who was 48, who, who also left school at 14, who had only ever left London when she was in the army, she was um, in, in the uh, Women's Auxiliary Army, um, and stationed in Wales. And she bravely chose to go to New Zealand because it was what my dad needed to do at the age of 48 on a one way ticket on a ship that took six weeks. And it went from uh, South East. Well, we went on a ship from Waterloo, to South, um, train from Waterloo to Southampton, and then the ship took six weeks, and then we arrived in New Zealand, and it was the middle of summer, December to January. And what happened in that intervening period was I got the great benefit of being a white working class girl in New Zealand in the late 60s and 70s. And being a white working class, has anyone ever been to New Zealand? Is anyone in New Zealand there? Oh, Kia Very close. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> just like your lives. We all did. <laughs> um, okay, so if you've been to New Zealand, you've been to Rotorua where the boiling hot are. Yeah? You've been to Taupo where the big lake is and the mountains. You've only been to the South Island? Yeah. Been to Auckland and Wellington? Wellington. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you drove, so if you went to Taupo and Rotorua to do the tourist thing, you drove through my small town. That thing John was saying earlier about the N4 going over. Yeah, that, that um, uh, Port Talbot. People go through my small town. My small town was 70% Māori and Polynesian when I was growing up. There were 26 languages in my primary school, and it was multicultural before it was trendy. And that was fucking amazing. Because everybody was an economic migrant. Everyone was poor. And while we were poor, it was a different kind of poor than we would have had had we stayed in London. And my other five siblings did stay in London until they were 16 and up, and it was swinging London, and it was 1968, so why would they go to a small town in New Zealand? Anyway, what I got out of that was all this amazing access to people for whom storytelling doesn't have to come from privilege. Storytelling doesn't have to come from being well educated. And storytelling doesn't only belong in buildings. Yes, I'm talking about Polynesian culture. I grew up with people who didn't have written language until the white people arrived and went, you don't do that. No, that's not language. No, that beautiful design that you've done there, that's not language. Let me explain language to you and show them writing. I grew up with people from Samoa, Maori people, Tongan people, Nguyen people, whose culture is purely an oral storytelling culture. And I grew up, therefore, understanding that everyone can be creative. However, I still thought that only posh people were actors or writers, because I didn't know any actors or writers, and it was three hours drive to close the theatre, and we never went to anything like that, and we never had any access to anything like that. And in fact, it was different from Hadley State in London, where at least my mum went uptown every year to make me go to a panto. Yeah? Because at least they had access to that. So we had no access to what we might now call formal arts provision. So on the one hand, they had this amazing cultural access, and on the other, nothing that we hear in Britain call art provision. When I was 15 years old, the scales fell from my eyes because there I was at my high school, it was 1978. Is anybody else around my age? Yes? Stasi and Hutch were on the telly, and these two guys came doing a show, and they were doing the two man Hamlet, right? And, and it was Shakespeare, and the language was beautiful, and I would now like to interrupt this to say, and no, it was not about the excellence. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, the excellence, the quality thing, it's such a fucking lie. Yeah? Who judges that? The excellence and quality, this whole um, goal one bullshit, the excellence and quality crap was made up 150 years ago by white men in suits. It's very early on in the fun colours of discussion, I was sitting in the Arts Council offices and a lovely man from the Arts Council, who shall be nameless, sat there and he said, he's wearing a really nice shirt, does that give you a clue? He said, Stella, how are you going to guarantee the excellence? <laughs> and I said, Neil. <laughs> not the shirt, it's a nice man. I said, Neil, I'm not. Because excellence is subjective and bullshit, but I am going to guarantee the excellence of engagement. You can't do that. Anyway, 
Thanks to people doing Shakespeare. The people doing Shakespeare were not in retrospect that good. Right? I now know this because I've been working in theatre for a very long time. They were that good, but they were vibrant and exciting and started in Hudson on the telly and they were blonde and they were brunette. And about halfway through, this is my story, we didn't have proper sitting on the floor. About halfway through, I realised that I knew the brunette one who looked like Celsi. Because he was Johnny Gibbons, and Johnny Gibbons was Pamela Gibbons' big brother. And Pamela Gibbons had been my best friend when I was seven, eight, nine, and ten. And her dad worked in the same mill as my dad. Her dad worked in the pulp and paper mill in the boiler room with my dad. My dad was a boilerman. He worked night shift. If there's nothing wrong with a boiler and you're a boilerman, you can read a book a night from the library, and my dad did. If there's something wrong with a boiler and you come back wanting about a stone less, covered in small birds and having to take a salt pill because you sweated everything out so much. Probably not salt pill in Silico, but it was salt pills in the 70s. Pamela Gibbons, big brother, was on, <laughs> it wasn't the stage, it was the whole floor, but he was being that time. Someone like me was being a performer. Someone like me was being an artist. Because of that, I know it's bullshit and a bit of a waste of our money to go, let's fly in with some amazing working class art. Some amazing working class art. It's amazing world class art to be poor working class people so they can see how great art is. Because what that does is it makes people think, fuck, I'm never going to be that good. I'm never going to attain that. God, I'll never get there. You bring in somebody who's like them, they go, wow, that could be me. Maybe I could do that. And while we're here, I know some of you are going, ah, oh, yes, but what about talent? <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing. It's a lie. And Mozart wasn't a genius. How do you know that? Because Mozart's dad made violins. And when Mozart was three years old, his father gave him a scale model of violin. And he was the best teacher in Salzburg. So, had your dad been a violin maker and given you a violin at the age of three, and had your dad been the best teacher in Salzburg, you too might be no <laughs> We don't know. We don't have the cure for cancer, and we don't have the cure for AIDS, and we don't have the cure for the austerity line, because we're not educating everybody. Until we educate everyone with the same education system, we cannot say this person is talented and that person is not. Because we do not have a level playing field from which to start. So, with all of this politics, I then come back to England going, what I want to do with my life, and I didn't come back and say I want to make fun politics. I want to be Lady Macbeth Stratford. <laughs> That's why at the age of 23, I sold my old possessions, I saved up for two years, and I arrived in England in 1986 with 200 pounds that he would last for six months. That's <laughs> quite a lot of money, you And anyway, I still want to be Lady Macbeth Stratford, and I still can, because she should be in her sixties. It's absurd. <laughs> Real ambition and thwarted power. These are yeah. almost past it. Oh, fuck, it's my last chance. <laughs> anyway, so then in my 20s, I was an actor mostly. And then in my 30s, I was mostly an actor and a novelist. And then in my 40s, I was mostly an actor and a novelist and a theatre director. And then I was working with a company of 17 people, a self created company. We were working in our own time. We were all doing other artistic things, but we wanted to see what it would be like to make E Ensemble. No director, no writer. Well, actually, it was about half a dozen writers and half a dozen directors. There were 17 of us aged between, no, there were 30 of us aged between 17 and 70. And we made a show together over three years, really slowly. And then I thought, should I really should find out more about the brilliant people who make ensemble work? So I went back and I started reading. And then I started reading about Joan Ford. And then I got really excited about the fact that there was this amazing woman that I only knew. I also only knew from Oh What a Lovely War, right? And I thought, oh my God, but she's amazing. She did all this stuff. Why don't we talk about it? Oh, I don't know, because she's a woman. Oh, I don't know, because she's a communist. Maybe one of those two things. Anyway, <laughs> and she, was, she was doing all this work, and I went to Improbable's annual devotion to the Scrantles event. If you don't go to the devotion to the Scrantles, do. It's going to be in Birmingham this year, so it's going to be closer for if you're in this part of the world. It's quite close to London. Anyway, I called a session that was, would anyone like to join with me in doing something for Jonah towards St. Henry um, on October 6, 2014? This was January 26, 2013, okay? And so it was uh, 20 months away. And um, so I was talking about farm palace and how it was never built and 
Joe's brilliant idea, Joe would set the price it up, it's a brilliant idea, bring all the arts, all the sciences together. Wouldn't it be amazing to be free for all the people? It's going to be in the East End because she discovered that the people who she loved and who she was making work for in the East End, having made work here, having made work over in the North East, came back down to East London. Those people weren't going uptown when the shows transferred. Not just because they couldn't afford the ticket, especially, but because it didn't feel like it was theirs. Uptown wasn't theirs. So Joan said, let's build them a building and they do feel like it's theirs. Of course it never happened. And she had pain for it for 15 years and it never happened. And then we went, well, why don't we just make some farm palaces anyway for the weekend of her anniversary? And this, if I can make the technology work, is what happened. This is last year. So we um, have a little bit more that I can tell you about this year. This is last year's farm palaces. It's got to be hands-on, because otherwise 
It's a different thing. It's a show. We're great to call it a show, but it's not a fun palace, yeah? I know I'm going really fast. I know I've got a lot to get through. Um, the thing about, am I asking people to work for free? No, because I don't care if you make a fun palace or not. You know, those people are doing it and they're finding it really beneficial and they're finding it's working for their organisations or for their community group or for their building or for their gym and their swimming pool where they got 2,000 people, 70% of them have never been to that space before, even though they were local. Um, and we're, again, we're hearing 50 and 70% as the numbers of new people coming in. I personally do not care that much about audience development. I do care that much about bringing in people who didn't think the arts and the sciences were for them. So if that's how it does it, that's great. I'm not saying we're the only way, we're a way, that's all. But I want to share with you, before I shut up, um, <coughs> loads of things, I want to share loads of things. Um, I want to say that what we're doing is we're changing the preposition. We do not believe in arts for all. We believe in arts for, by, and with all. Arts for all is instrumentalist, and patronising, and paternalistic, and patriarchal. Arts by, for, and with all enables each of us to do that which we might want to do. And it welcomes us each and, and allows for the fact that we change at different times in our lives. We may have more time. We may have less time. Yeah? It allows that for things change. What I've discovered, what we've seen, is that people are starting to come together. It's only two years. I don't know anything yet, right? I mean, it's all big and new, and we're starting to collect the um, evaluation and get some information. We know it's getting more people in. We know it's getting different people in. We know that last year, 64.8% of the fun palaces were outside London. And this year, 75% of the fun palaces were outside London. We don't need rebalancing. We know that there are way more black and ethnic minority people engaged in creating fun palaces as makers, not just as the people who turn up. When they're, when they're from community groups, when they're led by big organisations, obviously that's slightly different unless they're really asking people in. So that's all the things that I guess I need to say, but I want to share with you what Kareem, who is a non-arts professional, non-science professional, said about making a fun house last year and this year, because it's kind of heartbreaking and kind of brilliant. She's French, she made it with her friend Alexander, they worked together. I, was, I, I talked them on Twitter, that's how I knew her. Twitter has so been our friend in this. It's just, if you don't like Twitter, you're following the wrong people, okay? It's your fault. If you don't mind her, it's because you're following the wrong people. Twitter's great. Um, if you follow the right people. Now, Kareem has made a fun palace twice. And as I said, this year they decided to do it for free. They had a really hard time getting the venue. All the local venues. Publicly funded venues. The library. The local arts centre. The council building said no when they approached <coughs> them and they said, your building is closed on Sunday, can we use it? This is what she said. It seems, this is, this is after this year's fun palaces. It seems we were wrong thinking we were not welcome. Oh, and they said they wanted to do it because they wanted to integrate with their community. Because she and Alexander have both, they're not, they're not a couple, they've both had different experiences of living as foreigners in Britain after six years feeling like they didn't integrate. It seems we were wrong thinking we were not welcome, we just weren't looking in the right place. In the process of unearthing the resources of farming, so now you know what that art centre said, no, it's We've unearthed a wide breed of dinosaurs indeed, self-preserving, ultra-protective and narrow-minded, but we've also found a community of genuinely caring and generous people. Visitors used our fun palace with common tools, science, words, paintbrushes, musical instruments, to make sense of the world around them. What was shared on the day between makers and visitors was a common trust in making together, in creating social understanding and cohesion. This is not a funding bid. She is not an arts professional. That's what she got out of us saying, go for it. What help do you need? Now you went to talk to her about how to do more access stuff. Had a and talk to her about how to do more digital stuff. And a landlord from our office talked to her about how to fill in a bloody health and safety um, risk assessment form. You know, we've just made it possible. And we're a team of four. And we're paid two days each a week. And at the moment, I'm volunteering the other four days that I'm working on it because I, I mean, our money runs out in April. Somebody will come through. All we need is core funding to hold all this together. That's all we need. But what it is, is I believe this is the singing in the dark times. Yeah? Because we don't have an austerity of amazing people. And what this says, I hasten to add, because it's the opposite of big society. What this says is people believe 
a culture at the heart of their community and as the heart of their community. And the more we can prove that, the more those fuckers in Whitehall can't tell us it's not needed. And the way we do that is by doing it together. I have listened to 15 other brilliant people today telling me amazing things about the work you're all doing. But we are not working together. We're just not. Because we're tired and we're exhausted and it's really hard and we're in our little silos. And we're turning them together because so we're so scared that you might get my comment. There's enough to go around if we share it. I ask you to please join in and share it. I'm not saying fun palaces are your way. You may never want to do anything like that. But we can work together. And the more we work together, the faster we can make a change. Thank you very much. Taking a load of people dressed up as 
robots in this local park where there were families who had no idea this was happening and who don't seem to, they never go to the theatre. And it's a very divided area, Berlin is predominantly extremely white, white working class. Huge mix of people, huge people coming in. It was one of the skeleton crew of seven volunteers. Um, and we had over 400 people come through from this tiny little building in this high street in the middle of nowhere. I think there's something about being able to learn from publicity mm. and then people being able to use that on a local level. And also the fact that it's local and maybe the people who turn up have no idea that it's part of the national thing. You know, that's also that's fine with us. What we've seen, as I say, we've only done it two years so far, we've seen that people who've participated one year often say, could I do it? And then make one the next. That to me is the thrill. Joan Littlewood wanted to build one building. We've just taken over all of them. That's a quick question about the practicalities of contact. So it's just happened over a weekend? Is it yeah, the first weekend is October, because Joan Littlewood's birthday was the 6th of October. As it turns out, it's a good weekend. It's not hard to Kids have been back at school, primary school kids, for a, a month. It's sort of got that closing in harvest festival feel. So. Is there any kind of ideas for a, con a continuity within the practice that maybe there will be a permanent pump house somewhere? Is that on the horizon? Not for me, but I tell you, the amount of people who want it go and talk to them about the building they want to build. <laughs> uh, no, because I, I personally think we've got enough buildings. Seriously, I do. But I can't tell you the amount of people <coughs> with millions of pounds who want us to go and talk to them about how to make a pump house. They, they're welcome to. Yeah. But, but for me, a lot of it is about how better can we use the resources. Mm. Those office blocks that are closed overnight. Can the people see us and make a fun house for grown-ups? So it's not, I call it family neutral, which I realise doesn't sound very friendly, but it's certainly not aimed purely at families and kids. Um, ideally, it's aimed at everybody and there's something for everyone and the parents <coughs> don't feel like going, get the kids to do something and they stand back. Yes, one, one more question. Sorry, is, 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 your, is your relationship with the Arts Council predicated on just no com compromise at all? My, uh, my stick lack of compromise, you, yeah. Um, box, yeah, but we, we, we run out of, we, we used all their money. Yeah. Uh, we got, so we got an exceptional <laughs> award from them, £197,000, which we used to set the lot up. Now, we thought they understood. Well, because we applied for the first year. We called it for the pilot. Yeah. We thought they understood that that was one year funding and we were going to spend it all. Yeah. And then they went, no, no, that was three year funding. Like, no, it's an exceptional award. It's different to the rest of it. Anyway, we spent almost all of it in the first year yeah. because there was a, a massive setup. I mean, a real, the website is really expensive because we've made the website really easy. The back end of it just took forever so that anyone, who, even with really little digital or tech ability, is led through signing up really simply. And that, of course, costs tons. The more simple it looks, yeah, yeah. the more expensive it is. Yeah. Um, but that's fine, because that's done now. Yeah. And that's brilliant, because the Arts Council and Space pay for that, and that's great for them. Um, so now, our relationship with the Arts Council is based on um, somebody has to say, you guys are making goal two of participation, and you're not following it up, yeah. and you're not doing it and you're allowing people to do a tick box. I mean, I know with the NPOs they're starting to change that. But you are allowing people to do a tick box on it and say, we did one workshop. It's just not good enough. They know that. Yeah. They know it, certainly within the Hallowed Halls. All of the Arts Council officers know it. All of the regional officers know it. I get to speak it really loudly and be the provocateur outside. It's fine. I think, I think that makes everybody happy. Yeah, no, you know. I want to share that. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Because everyone else is going on, in, you know, that's the thing, it's divine and conquer. You will end up going in there. And, yes, uh, we should. You know, it is, it is, you know. And, and you know, and the other thing to say about the Arts Council is the Arts Council was invented for amateurs. SEMA was not invented for, you guys know this, right? When, when Maynard Keys invented the Arts Council, it was for amateur artists coming back from war. It was SEMA, C E M A. And it was for amateur artists coming back so they had something to do and sort of funding to help them re establish their orchestras and everything. It merged into the Arts Council, which in the past few years has become all about professionalisation and no, we won't fund that. We won't fund things like amazing community groups because they're not professional and we'll, you know, we'll pay another two million to an opera. Um, you know, that thing. Personally, if it all falls apart, which I think we're heading there with this government, I don't believe that there's not going to be a great phoenix. I just don't. And maybe a little bit of a fire to burn away some of the, you know, the excess 
that is going on to our earth. Because we're going to make amazing work anyway. And it's shit that we have to make amazing work anyway. It's shit that we have to be exhausted. It's shit that I've had cancer twice and never had sick pain. But we're going to do it anyway. We just need them, not the arts council, they're on our side. We need, we need the government to understand that this is the heart of society. We'll get there. I think of Amanda and Rachel. Sorry. We're very frightened. We're not very happy now. <laughs> Just not what the work is. 
There has been a great deal about the relationship between the audience and the stage. Um, wonderful Andy Smith spoke about that a lot this morning. Some of you were in that group. He talked about the interdependency. It's not about there's what goes on on stage and there's the audience. Um, and there's <coughs> about our audience is sometimes locked out of what's happening in some theatres. Does it sometimes feel as if theatre is something that's done to them? But he talked about, no, actually, it's about interdependency. And for him, he said, my audience are my collaborators. We are all in the room together. Which, which led, led me in my thinking to, I found Reese's, Reese's personal story altogether very moving and engaging. We talked a lot today about story and the power of story. And as soon as something becomes a personal story, it becomes something we can all engage with, I think. Sometimes more easily than abstraction. Um, he talked about not being in a theatre since he was 15. And it was interesting to me that his engagement when he was nearly 15 was not by going to watch something, but was by doing it, was by making, was by becoming a maker. And that's obviously absolutely what Stella has been talking about for me uh, just now, about art, not only, not it's not art for all, it's art by all, it's art with all. Um, people believing and knowing that culture is at the heart of their community, but knowing that for themselves, not because somebody tells them that. How do people develop without culture? Um, and I was particularly interested in what you said about people who didn't know that they were interested. And that actually, certainly in my experience, people only get to know they're interested by doing it very, very often rather than watching in a way that doesn't feel as if it's connected to them. Um, I just wanted to finish by saying, for me, oh, one of the other oppositions we've talked about isn't necessarily an opposition, it's past and present. We've talked quite a lot about history and about the things that maybe uh, can feel like dinosaurs, can, are they relevant now? How does history find its way into the present and work? How do we ensure if works to be relevant, what's the relationship between the now and the history? Um, but for me, I just wanted to say, I, I think that the, the academic and, well, who was it who said this morning, and was it, was it James who said non, the academic and non-academics, and then he said no, not non-academics, non what do we call all the rest of us who are not the academics? Um, but I think that's also been about what today's about, it's about bringing together uh, the academic and the non-academic. <laughs> The rest of the world. The rest of the world. <laughs> or sometimes it's said the real people. <laughs> but you don't say that if you work in theatre because it's definitely not real people. <laughs> and and I, I feel um, that that has also been really illuminating and really interesting. There's been very different kinds of voices. I'll admit that I've been heard at least one or two speakers today where I had not a clue what they were talking about. Absolutely no idea. And I, I, and I think that's because I'm not in that world. And I know that sometimes people in the world of theatre are accused quite rightly of likewise speaking in a language that people who are not in that world don't know what they're talking about. And bringing it right back to the people that we want to be working with, communities. Um, it, I think for me there's a lot that I'll take from today that's actually about language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
or you know, a community project somewhere completely different? And how do you sort of hold those differences without becoming siloed um, and find sort of ways through them? And so one of the things that I found really um, like quite moving actually about a lot of today is that like, sort of hearing some of those conversations happening. So um, so thank you actually for like, those mm-hmm. things and for, for being here. It feels um, something, I don't know. Um, important is sort of too big a word for when people just sort of get in the room and talk, but anyway. Um, so I think uh, I think Stella's sort of suggestion at the end uh, there that actually we need to sort of think about sharing, ways of sharing, um, and that there might be enough to go around of something, at least, uh, I think is a way out of thinking about that, that austerity and that cruelty. One of the other things that um, I think uh, was particularly interesting uh, in one of the panels that I was in today was uh, the suggestion uh, or, or some thinking through the idea of resilience. Uh, one of the things I've been hearing a lot about is sort of the ways that people keep going um, in the face of some really quite extraordinary sort of odds being stacked against them, um, both inside the theatre of makers and also just right now generally. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that have been, that's been interesting about that discussion of resilience is both the fact there might be a set of strategies, tactics, tools that uh, could be developed to, um, actually, I went to a professional training about resilience for researchers yesterday. It was rubbish. <laughs> um, but sort of um, one of the things that was interesting about that was that actually that sort of language of resilience is, um, as others were saying uh, sort of earlier on today, um, is in itself a kind of sort of, sort of de- a devolution strategy which sort of throws responsibility back on individuals to kind of, to be resilient. Um, and I think there's a sort of interesting tension there between how we look after ourselves and each other and actually that, that, that we might want to and be able to find creative ways of doing that and of supporting each other um, and ourselves. But also that sometimes um, that that might be a tough thing to be doing and to be doing. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've been sort of thinking about a lot over the day is sort of the sort of very privileged position of those of us sort of who work in the academy and just get to watch and look and think and talk about things. Um, it's, a, it's a hugely privileged place to be in. Um, so thank you for reminding me again. <laughs> um, the other things that I think have been really interesting about today have been about sort of, uh, the multiple ways of talking about, thinking about occupying space uh, that have been going on from actual sort of occupations to temporary fun palettes, takeovers, uh, to thinking about what the possibilities of, uh, you know, a building that has a place and stays there uh, might be. And I think that's rich, and I'd, I'd be really interested to hear some more about this. So I'm sort of throwing out some things that, uh, that you are probably all more expert in than me and might be like pick up and talk about. Um, and then I guess the last two things that I wanted to say is that I think one of the things that's sort of been sort of organising today for me is that there have been several things going on. So I've been thinking about how we make theatre in times of austerity. And also talking about particular companies and practitioners uh, who might be sort of making theatre with or by those for whom austerity is really uh, sort of particularly pressing on. Uh, and that seems to be like, that I think there might be two conversations there. Uh, I think they belong in the same sort of space, but that I think that there's been several things going on there. And the other thing I've been hearing a lot about is about theatre as several things, so theatre, like the power of the theatre events, and I'm thinking of those sort of beautiful, extraordinary um, photographs um, that we saw of uh, John Fouts' work this morning, like actually, you know, what happens when people get together at an event. We're hearing a lot about theatre as a process, uh, and where we can learn things from the processes, from the making, you know, exactly that sort of the politics is in the doing of it. Um, and also uh, sort of theatre as a tool, uh, something which has strategies possibilities um, that might, that, and that thinking like that might help us think about the relationships between uh, theatre and the real world, it's part, it is the real world, uh, but that it's, so yeah, theatre is a better process and tool, and there's been like, sort of three different kinds of ways of thinking that's been going on today, uh, and thank you for letting us listen, it's been, uh, it's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you.